to the water all who are thirsty come and be filled oh come come to the river brothers and sisters come and be healed sing that again with me come on oh come come to the water all who are thirsty, come and be filled. Oh, come, come to the river, brothers and sisters, come and be healed. Come and be
On July 16th, uh, 1969, 650 million people tuned in. Some of you already know what I'm about to say. They tuned in to watch Neil Armstrong and his crew launch from Cape Kennedy to get one mission done, one thing done, to get to the moon and back. Not just get to the moon and say, we got there, but to get back. And they did it and they succeeded. And many of you in this room watched it. Maybe you're sitting and you're watching TV and you saw this thing happen. Incredible. It changed the game. It changed the nature of what it looks like to relate to outer space. This was a moment to remember. And many of you do remember that. We all have those moments. You're watching something happen, right? It's incredible. But here's what's crazy about that moment is that the computer that got Apollo 11 to the moon and back Okay? The computer that they use to get to the moon and back is over 100,000 times less powerful than the phone in your pocket. The phone in your pocket, that iPhone, that Android, probably not Android actually, just iPhone. Uh, <laughs> the iPhone in your pocket, the Android in your pocket is over 100,000 times more powerful than the computer that got Apollo 11 to the moon and back. That's a lot of power in your pocket. And what's crazy is in 20 years, we're going to look back and think, yo, iPhone 13? You kidding me? Technology is advancing in this such rapid pace. It's incredible to watch and to be a part of it. As somebody who is a millennial, I was born and there was technology and the iPhone came out. And then, man, I've, I've learned, I'm not like a native, but I've kind of learned that technology is this thing. You have to adapt quickly. It's coming. It's amazing. And it changes your life. What it was designed to do completely changes everything. But here's what makes me laugh about the whole thing, because there's a serious limitation to it all. If that phone in your pocket runs out of battery, it can't do anything. It's kind of funny, right? Like we have all of this technology, but your iPhone only lasts for about 24 hours. It can only do what it was designed to do as long as it has battery. That's a huge limitation in my mind. It's kind of laughable. Like that thing can take a moon or a, a ship to the moon and back. But if it runs out of battery, it cannot do what it was designed to do. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called Flourish. And if you're new here, Flourish is our, year, our, our word for the year as a church. We're trying to flourish as disciples of Jesus. That's what we're trying to do here. And we've been spending a little bit of time in Genesis 1 and 2 looking at how God intended, us for, uh, intended for us to flourish because he has intended for us to flourish. So we've looked at Genesis 1, Genesis 2. We'll be in Genesis 2 tonight. But in the same way an iPhone can't do what it was designed to do without battery, without a source of power in life, you and I cannot flourish in the way God intended us to if we do not stay connected to our source of life, our source of power. So all the work that you put into flourishing is for nothing if you do not have life, energy, and battery. Put it simply, flourishing is a result of rest. I want to talk about rest tonight. Because flourishing has everything to do with rest, more so even than work. So if you have your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, we're going to dive in and talk about this idea of rest. Uh, Genesis 2, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. It should be on the screen for you. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Okay, 
Obviously, we're picking this up in the middle of the story. There are six days before the seventh day, right? So before we talk about the first six days, I want to kind of ask a question here. And it should be a question that leaps off the page when you read Genesis 2. When you, when you read this, you should be asking this one question. It's this. Why did God need to rest? Like, was he tired? Did he have a long day of work and he just got home, kicked his feet up, relaxed, take the load off and crack open a nice cold beverage and watch the Cowboys lose for the 27th year in a row? I mean, he probably did. Uh, I'm a Cowboys fan. I can say that. I love the Cowboys. It's disappointing. Anyways, no, but why did God rest? And it wasn't because he was tired. I have a theory and I have a suggestion that I want to make. But before we get there, we need to look at the first six days of creation. Okay. So let me read for you Genesis chapter one. You may be familiar with this. If not, let's go there and talk about it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, let's stop there. This is painting a picture of what the world was like, what creation was like before God went to work, before he started to do stuff and order things. This is what we see at the beginning of time. It says the earth was without form and void. There's a Hebrew words that are translated in this way. If we look at the literal translation, very helpful at what's actually happening here, okay? The Hebrew word for without form, translated here as without form, it literally means wild, wild. So think about your backyard after you haven't mowed in three months, but a lot worse. It's wild, it's chaos. There's no structure, no, no organization, total disorder. There's nothing that makes sense in it, okay? Without form, wild. The Hebrew word translated here as void means waste, which means uninhabited, lifeless. There's nothing there. So there's disorder, there's chaos, there's absolutely no structure, no organization, and there's also no life there, no habitation, nothing, no activity, no movement. It's all completely void and without form. But we also see that there's darkness over the face of the deep. So the picture of creation before God goes to work is one of wild and waste and dark. That's where we see ourselves in Genesis 1. But it says the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. What's really cool is this word spirit is ruha, and it means not just spirit, but breath. So the breath of God, just picture this. There's complete just formlessness, chaos, and the breath of God is hovering over it all. And when I was reading this, I could just feel the anticipation, just like God's about to go to work and bring order to all of this and fill it with life. And so he does. Days one through three, what does he begin to do? He creates these realms, these realms and these spaces to out of the chaos. So day one, uh, day one, he creates time, the realm of time, okay? He creates night and he creates day. On day two, he creates the realm of the sky. And then on day three, he creates the realm of land and sea. Do you see what he's doing? He's, he's taking what was without form and he's bringing form to it create time, night, and day. And then I'm also going to create the sky that's going to be above the land. I'm going to create the land. I'm going to separate land from the waters. And he's bringing order to it all. And then days four through six are really cool because they parallel each other. Day one, he creates time. And in day four, he fills time with the sun and moon and stars. So what does he begin to do? Fill these realms with life, with habitation. What was once waste is now full of life and activity. On day five, and, uh, on day five he creates fish, birds, beasts on the land. He's filling these realms that he has created with life. And finally, on day six, he creates humans, you and I. He creates us to rule over it all. So he has this world that is without form and void, wild and waste and dark. And he brings lightness, light, and he brings order, and he brings life to it. And then he also creates authority structures. He puts human beings in charge of it all to make it clear. And they're tasked with, go, with going and representing God in creation by ruling and reigning in the way that God would. Okay, this is the picture that we have in Genesis 1. He's brought order and he's brought life. It was once wild and waste, now there's order, and now there's life, and now there's light, okay? And then God stands back and says, it's all very good. Then we get to day seven, okay? Let's take another look at day seven. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. 
So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This day, day seven stands in stark contrast to the rest of the days. This is different. This day is different. Here's what I mean. Every other day, day one through six, six, it starts with, and God said, and God said, and God said, every single day, one through six, and God said, thus, thus, there's a conclusion. There's a, therefore, this is a, something's coming to a close. And what has come to a close? Creation. God is no longer, no longer creating on day seven. He's already done the creative work. And now on day seven, he's just resting. That's what he's doing. He's no longer creating. And that word resting uh, in Hebrew, it literally means to stop working. It's not complicated. God just stopped working. It was done. The work was finished and he sat back and he just rested. So that's one way this day is different. He's no longer working. The creative work has been accomplished. And because of that, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. There are only two other times in this creation story where God blesses something. It's very interesting. I'm going to nerd out really quick. Days one through six, there's only two other parts of creation that he blessed. Everything he calls good, but only two parts he blesses. Okay. The first one in Genesis one is he blesses the animals and the birds and the fish. And then he blesses human beings. This blessing that God gives this part, these parts of creation has everything to do with flourishing. Because he says, hey, I, I bless you so that you can flourish, so that you can grow and reproduce and cover the entire earth. So this blessing is literally a blessing so that they might go flourish. But human beings are given something a little extra. Human beings are given this blessing, not just to flourish and to uh, reproduce and to cover the earth, but also to subdue it and to rule over it and have dominion over it in the way that God would. And he blessed them in his image, meaning they are to represent his creativity, his goodness, his power, his wisdom, his abundance. They're to represent him in all of creation. And then he blesses a day. He blessed these parts of creation to help them flourish, but then he blesses a day and makes it holy. There's something about this day. There's something about this day that God has something special for, because it has everything to do with your flourishing, with my flourishing. So why? What was so special about this day outside of the fact that he rested? I get it. He rested. He stopped working. He blessed it. He made it holy. But what is going on here? Because it's very, very clear that there's <laughs> something special. The, the rhyme has stopped. And God said, and God said. And actually, in days one through six, at the end of the days, it says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. All the way through day six. That's how every day ends in the story. But this one, it actually doesn't end. That's what's special about this day. It doesn't end or it wasn't supposed to end ever. There was something eternal about this day. You ever had that day where you get to the end of the day in the evening and you're like, I don't want to go to bed, man. Today was the best. This is what God was feeling in this moment. He creates and he stands back and he rests and he's like, man, I don't want this day to end. So he is God. So he doesn't allow it to end. What was so good about this day that we have to ask that question. What was so good about this day that God didn't want it to end? In the ancient Near East, in this time that Genesis was written, divine rest was equated with temple building. Chris mentioned this last week, but if a God was seen as resting or described as resting, that means that he had accomplished building his dwelling place, the place where he was going to reside and abide and be present in. This is the imagery in Genesis 2, that God, after he had brought order and brought life, he has finally finished his temple. All of creation is his temple. That's what he's building. If you go forward into Exodus and you see the tabernacle that God tells Moses to build, there's imagery from this story in the tabernacle, which is the place of meeting God in the Old Testament. God was building his dwelling place. At the beginning of creation, the spirit of God was hovering over the creation. And in this moment, after he finishes everything, he decides for his presence to fill creation. And he comes down and he fills it all. But the best thing about the whole thing is he didn't want to just do that alone. 
He didn't create all of it and then dwell in it and be like, man, this is a pretty sweet little man cave I got right here. He invites us into it. He created us in his image because he's, this is what he didn't want to end. This is the eternal part of day seven is not just that he dwells in creation, but that he dwells in creation with you and me. He, didn't, he, he literally did not want that to end. He does not want that to end. This is why day seven was so special because finally the creation that he finished, he could finally dwell with and be with. He wanted companions. He wanted partners, someone to share in his goodness and love. He wants to dwell with his people, dwell with his creation. So here's, here's my definition of rest, okay? Because on day seven, we get rest. God is resting, he's not working, and he invites you and I into that rest as he dwells with us. So here's rest. Rest is dwelling with God. Rest, as simply put, is dwelling with God, being with God. That's what rest is. If you think rest is just not working, you have the wrong definition of rest. Here's why. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. Work has always been, is, and will always be a part of life. Work was there before the fall. Before sin entered the world, God came to Adam and Eve and said, work and keep the garden. Work was always a part of the deal. And guess what? In the second coming, when Jesus comes back, He's not coming back so that we can just sit on the couch and hang out for eternity. He's coming back to restore what was lost in creation that you and I might partner with him to rule and reign over creation. The difference will be Satan will be gone. The enemy will be gone. There'll be no resistance. There'll be no disease, no sickness, no conflict. It's all gone. So we're ruling and reigning with Jesus in creation with no resistance. Amen. I'm in for that. Work has always been a part of the deal, always been part of creation. It was built into the fabric of creation, period. So then my question is, why do we feel so unrested? If I asked for a show of hands, how many of you genuinely feel rested right now? My guess is not many of us would raise our hands. And if if so, great. I want, I mean... But as, even as I was writing this sermon, I was tired. <laughs> like writing this sermon about rest, and I'm like, man, I could go to sleep right now. <laughs> Why do we feel so unrested? Well, we have to look at the next part of the story. You see, God creates everything, and it's good, very good. And he gives Adam and Eve these marching orders, and he says, okay, work and keep the garden. In other words, make sure the creation that I made flourishes and reaches its potential. So he gives Adam and Eve this job to go and help creation reach its potential. But he wants them to do that in connection to him. He wants them to do this all while staying connected to their source of power, their source of life, their source of rest. And they did that by trusting that God was going to give them what they needed, that God was his source, their source of abundance and of life and of rest. Okay, and there's this tree in creation called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this tree represents a choice. Is Adam and, our, is Adam and Eve, are they going to trust that God has what they need or are they gonna reach out and try and do things on their own? Are they gonna trust that God is their abundance or are they gonna reach out and try and find abundance on their own terms? This is what the tree represents. Spoiler alert, they go and try and do things on their own. They, they go outside of the bounds that God had given them. They reach and they eat the tree and therefore are separated from God. They're separated from their source of life, their source of rest. They get kicked out of the garden and now everything that was supposed to be a blessing is no longer a blessing. The land that they were supposed to work and keep is now gonna fight back. How many of you feel like work fights back sometimes? The fall, Genesis 3. They're working the land and it's not a blessing anymore. Sure, it brings the occasional blessing like food, but it fights back and it's hard. Reproduction, childbirth, now painful. All of these things that were supposed to be a blessing are now curses. Relationships, conflict. This is the result of being disconnected from our source of rest, our source of life. And the consequences are huge. This is why your nine to five drains you so much. 
This is why, why raising kids while is amazing and there's so much blessing also is exhausting and draining. Would, I believe you, would you believe me if I told you those things weren't actually supposed to be draining? That's hard to believe, man. I got a two and a half year old and a three month old. Those things were not supposed to be draining. These things that were blessings are now curses because now we're not working from a place of rest. We're not working from a place of being connected to our father, connected to the one who is the source of abundance and blessing. And I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be sensitive because a lot of you are insensitive. A lot of you are, are in here thinking, man, I, I feel like I'm dwelling with God, right? That's rest. Rest is dwelling with God. I feel like I'm doing that. Life is just hard, man. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Life's really hard. And Jesus actually promises that in this life, you will have trouble. So this sermon's not about trying to avoid hardship and trouble. It's about flourishing in the midst of it. And that's possible and we can grow in that. So how do we grow in that? How do we grow in our ability to flourish and find rest even in the middle of situations that are exhausting, that cause strife and conflict? It is possible to flourish in those situations. How do we do that? If you fast forward into the story, you start to read the gospels and you see this man named Jesus and Jesus comes on the scene. He's claiming to some pretty pretty crazy claims. He's, cra- he, he's claiming to be the son of God and he goes around living like it. And we're begged to ask this question, was he going to be better than Adam? Is Jesus going to succeed where Adam failed? So then you see Jesus go into the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan. It's the same thing that happened in Genesis three and Jesus is now there. Is he going to fail or is he going to succeed like Adam or, or fail like Adam or is he going to succeed? Adam was tempted in the garden and failed. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and withstood it and succeeded. And you're looking at Jesus's life and you think, man, is he going to doubt in the goodness of God? Is he going to, is he going to fail and fall short like Adam did? And no, Jesus lived in the goodness of God. Is, is, is he going to doubt like Adam did and think that, man, God's holding out on me, or maybe I just should, should try and do things my own way. Is, is Jesus going to do that too? And you fast forward in, in Jesus's life and you see Jesus in a garden, the garden of Gethsemane. What does he do? He falls down on his face and says, not my will, but yours. So the whole time Jesus succeeds where Adam fails. He perfectly represented the image of God. He perfectly lived a life in communion with God where he found rest. You want to know something? This is crazy. I'm just thinking about this right now. Do you remember the story when Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish? What did he do after that? I'll tell you what I'll do after a ministry event. I'll tell you what I'll do. We'll have a huge ministry event. I'm going to go home and sleep. That's what I'm going to do. It's tiring, man. Y'all are exhausting. But what does Jesus do? He goes and prays. He's crazy. He just spent hours upon hours teaching these people about the bread of life. And then he actually shows them that he is the bread of life. And he goes home, actually goes onto a mountain and prays. Because Jesus knew what rest was. That rest was not sleep. Rest was communion with God. Rest was dwelling with God. This is the rest Jesus had, but he didn't hoard it. He actually offers it to you. He offers it to me. It's available. Check this, check this out. Matthew 11, familiar verse, but maybe it's framed a little differently now. Come to me, Jesus says, all who labor and are heavy laden. What are the qualifications for coming to Jesus? Are you tired? Are you exhausted? Are you worn out? Are you burdened? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is good news. That brings life to my soul just reading it to you guys. Jesus' invitation to you today, whether you've followed him forever or if you've never followed him before, is this, come to me and find rest. Come into my presence and find rest. 
And guess what? That rest will never end just like the seventh day. The seventh day never ended. Well, this rest that Jesus offers you will never end. Well, how do I know that? Because the same Jesus who in the garden said, not my will, but yours, obeyed God all the way to the cross. He died the death you should have died and he lived the life you should have lived, but then he didn't stay in the grave. He rose again and in his resurrection proved that the rest he offers you right now will never end. It is eternal rest. that the work of this rest is finished. If you see the Old Testament, everyone's striving, trying to find this rest. They're trying to strive and God's trying to lead them to this land and restore what was lost in the garden. He's like, hey, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, all you guys come to this land and I'll dwell with you and I'll be in your presence. And they all fail. The work that they were trying to accomplish to get into God's presence and to rest was not accomplished. But Jesus on the cross shouts, it is finished. The work needed to be accomplished for you to find rest was completed in Jesus, in his work on the cross. That's good news. And it's available to you today, not just when you die. That rest is available today, right now at 8.03 PM. All you have to do is receive it. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's implicit in that is you can't actually work for it. You just have to go to Jesus and receive it. So how do you do that? I want to talk about how you receive rest from Jesus for the last five or so minutes. I have three, three words, rhythms, wisdom, and trust. Okay. Rhythms, wisdom, and trust. First, we we receive rest through regular rhythms. After God delivers the Israelites from Egypt, he leads them into the wilderness and gives them 10 commandments. And one of those commandments that takes up about 30% of the entire commandment is keep the Sabbath day, keep it holy. What does that mean? God gave his people 24 hours of break, of no work called the Sabbath. So from Friday night to Saturday night, the Jewish people would rest. They wouldn't do anything. They had a Sabbath day and God took this very seriously. It's woven in the fabric of creation. And God says, Hey, remember this, remember that I'm God and you're not. That's what Sabbath day is. That's what rest is. It's coming to God and saying, Hey, I'm not God. I don't want to run my life because it's exhausting. So how about you do it, God? That's what Sabbath rest is about. And you're laughing probably right now thinking, yeah, right. 24 hours a week, a whole day of not doing anything. You don't know my life. I'm not necessarily suggesting you do a whole day. Although if you want to work up to that, that'd be cool. But I am suggesting, hey, do you have regular rhythms of rest? Do you have regular space in your life where you just rest? And now you're probably like, well, how do you do that? What does it look like to me to rest? Well, I made an acronym for you out of rest so that you'll remember. Check this out. Let's see how it goes. Relax. (laughs) You you have permission to relax. You know that? That you don't have to strive every single day. Like you can, you can create a space in your life that God ordained for you to just relax. Just sit down, take a load off, take all expectations off yourself, whether it's for a whole day or just for a night or just for 30 minutes, just relax. Next is enjoy. God gave the Israelites like commands to party. Did you know that? There are commands that he gives to the Israelites that basically say, hey, make sure and throw this party every seven years and throw this party uh, every year on this day, on this month. God tells his people to party, to enjoy creation. There's nothing like remembering that God is God than when you enjoy when you just enjoy what he's given you, you have permission to do that. For me, for example, if I'm resting, if I have a space of rest, I'm going to eat whatever I want. I'm not going to worry about what I'm putting into my body. I'm just going to enjoy it. You have permission to enjoy it. Next is stop. Stop what? Everything. Just stop. Just stop working. Put your phone away. Stop worrying about that conversation you're going to have to have next week. Stop worrying about the conflict that you have in your family. Stop worrying about all of it. Just stop. You have permission. Let God be God. You're a bad God. No offense. You're a really bad God. 
Stop trying to run your life. Sabbath is so that you can remember you're not the one running your life. God is. And lastly, Thanksgiving. How do you know if you're resting? Are you thanking God for everything he's done, who he is, whether you see it or not? Just spend time thanking God in this space of rest. This is what a rhythm of rest looks like. I don't know if it's 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes a week, maybe start with five minutes a week. I don't know what your schedule is. Start somewhere and create these regular rhythms of rest. And as you do this over time, you will become a person of rest. Rest won't be something that you do. It'll be who you are. It'll be in you. And you'll be going around and people will wonder why you're so calm, why you're, why you're so non-anxious. And your answer is because I let God be God. Okay, so we receive the rest of Jesus through regular rhythms of rest. And we also receive the rest of Jesus through wisdom. I want to point something out quickly and, and just say in, in the creation story, God brought order and then he rested. And some of us are not experiencing rest because we're living life out of order. That, that we're doing things disordered. Easy example, if you're dating someone and you've decided to sleep with them before you get married, my guess is that your relationship is filled with insecurity, doubt, strife, conflict. And if it isn't yet, I would just warn you that that's living life out of order. And when you live life out of order, it only creates strife and only creates conflict and anxiety and worry. So my question is, are you, is there any area of your life that you're living out of order? And then lastly, we receive rest by trusting in Jesus. All of this boils down to trust. Are, are you going to come to Jesus and just surrender? Just stop trying to run your life. Stop trying to find rest in any other way. Just come to Jesus and surrender. I was playing uh, with Play-Doh with my son yesterday. And, and he was like, hey, dad, you want to play Play-Doh with me? I was like, yeah, buddy. So he's sitting in his chair and I'm playing Play-Doh with him. And he, I was like, what do you want me to build? And he was like, um, can you build a house? I was like, yeah, I can try. And so I, I grabbed the Play-Doh and I'm starting to make this house. And I say, all right, buddy, here's what you got to do. When you're building a house, you got to make sure first thing is you have a really solid foundation. Okay. So I took a huge chunk of Play-Doh and I just threw it on his chair and like smashed it down. Like that was my foundation. And I said, Hey, this foundation, make sure the house does not fall. If you have this foundation and you build the house on it, it will not fall. And that's what it means to trust in Jesus. That if you come to Jesus and you trust him and you surrender your life to him, you're building a foundation that cannot be shaken. It cannot be stirred. That your rest cannot be taken from you permanently. It might be stolen in moments because there's an enemy out there who hates your guts and who wants you to experience strife and conflict. That is true. He hates you and wants to destroy you. But when you trust in Jesus, that foundation of rest, that foundation of presence with God, no matter what's going on, no matter what hardship and toil, you can have rest in the presence of Jesus. So as we close, we're going to sing one more song. And as, as we get there, I want to read that passage again from Matthew 11. And I want you to just receive it and allow the Lord to speak to you through it. And then we'll close. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 says this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you that after Genesis chapter three, you did not leave Adam and Eve naked and ashamed, but you covered them. You covered them with the animal skin. And I can't help but think that that's foreshadow foreshadowing for what was coming. That you would send Jesus to be the lamb of the world that would cover the sins of the entire world. 
And it's in believing in that and trusting that that we truly find rest. And I'm also aware that there's people in this room that that have followed Jesus for a long time. They've been there, they've done that. And and even today you are inviting them into greater rest, which comes through greater surrender. And so I pray for courage right now in the name of Jesus, that we would have the courage to surrender whatever that thing is we're trying to hold on so tightly to. Give us the courage to trust you with those things, Lord. And please give us rest that we would be a people at this church that when the world looks at us, they are shocked at how rested we are. And that that rest that we're showing them through our lives would draw them into the one who gives it. So create us into a people of rest, Jesus. We love you. Thank you for coming to save us from our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I search the world
Thank you.